Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Building the Next Generation of Wireless Miniaturized Microscopes. I am Kristen Perechentiel of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. For more information, please visit labroots.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Payman Golshani. Dr. Golshani obtained his MD and PhD from UC Irvine and UC Davis, where he trained under the mentorship of Dr. Edward G. Jones on the development of corticothalamic synapse. He then completed his neurology residency at UCLA and obtained postdoctoral training with Dr. Felix Schweizer and Dr. Guoping Fan, where he studied the role of DNA methylation in development of cortical circuits. He then became faculty, and in collaboration with Dr. Portier Calio and Dr. Stelios Smirnakis, studied the developmental desynchronization of internally generated activity in the cerebral cortex. His independent laboratory now investigates how cortical microcircuits in the awake behaving animal encode sensory input and how disorders such as autism and developmental epilepsies disrupt functional cortical connectivity. I will now turn it over to Dr. Golshani for his presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm uh, really uh, excited to sort of use this new venue uh, of presenting our, our work on these new generation of wireless miniaturized microscopes and this whole effort to open source miniaturized microscopes. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, three collaborators that have worked with us closely. Uh, the collaborators are Alcino Silva, Balci Kak, and Dejan Markovic, who uh, together as part of a Brain Initiative grant, we have uh, been, been designing and building uh, these new generation uh, miniaturized microscopes, and uh, I, none of this would be possible without them. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, three people that have been really instrumental in building and using the microscopes. Uh, the first is Daniel Aroni, who was actually our main engineer, and uh, he designed uh, all the miniaturized, uh, new generation miniaturized microscopes, and uh, and uh, designed, built, and revised these microscopes until they were usable. And Tristan Schumann and Denise Kai. Tristan is a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, and Denise Kai is a postdoctoral post fellow in uh, Dr. Alcino Silva's lab, and. Uh, Tristan and Denise worked together and uh, tested out these microscopes over and over and optimized them so that they were usable and good enough to share with the community. So if, uh, if you, as we are interested uh, in really trying to record the activity patterns of large numbers of cells, we are, uh, we are, we have a lot of limitations to deal with. Uh, we would like to be able to record the activity of a large number of cells. We would like the, there to be single cell resolution, and uh, we would also like to be able to uh, record, record, uh, over a, record these same cells over many, many days to weeks to months. Uh, however, uh, this is not possible with, with most technologies. For example, with EEGs or local field potentials, you can record across several days to weeks. However, you don't have any single cell resolution. 
you can uh, uh, you can record with uh, tetrodes, for example, but uh, and get single cell resolution in freely behaving animals. However, uh, you can't record from these cells usually over many days to weeks. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. Plus, uh, you would like to be able to identify the cell types to record from. And so, one technique that has been developed uh, recently um, by, uh, by the, the Schnitzer lab and uh, later commercialized is this, these miniaturized fluorescence microscopes. And we decided to, uh, to try to build these microscopes ourselves and then to improve on them to make the new generation of these microscopes and then to make them available to the community. So, uh, so how do you think about these types of uh, fluorescent microscopes? So in essence, you, should, you can think about the, the microscopes that you have, the epifluorescent microscopes that you, you may have in your lab, where you use them to look at fixed tissue, for example, fluorescent fixed tissue. Uh, in essence, these miniaturized microscopes are exactly that. So you, can, you, uh, you shine uh, light over the, the sample at a particular wavelength, and fluorescence comes back and you can record this emitted light. Uh, uh, the technique has several drawbacks compared to, for example, to photon microscopy in the sense that you can, uh, out of focus light is also imaged that, and uh, there's a great deal of scattering. However, uh, with the new techniques that we've developed, uh, these limitations are far, uh, the, the benefits are far, far outweigh the, the limitations in the sense that you can record in freely behaving animals uh, with with really uh, great great uh, temporal resolution and spatial resolution, and uh, and we, we can record from uh, identified cells, and so you can take this emitted light that comes back, and you can uh, look at the activities of the cells that that you get, and so so imagine your de your desktop fluorescent microscope. This is an example from an Olympus. The X51 microscope, and imagine that now you uh, take each of the parts of this microscope that are absolutely essential and uh, and miniaturize it. And so, for example, you can take uh, uh, you can take the 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 camera and uh, miniaturize that to a little cell phone camera. And the excitation light, which is generally provided by an LED or by uh, a mercury lamp can now be provided by a tiny little LED. And, and so you, you take all these components and you miniaturize them to the point that you can put them on the head of an animal. And that's essentially what we do with these miniaturized microscopes. Uh, the objective is replaced by a grin lens, the imaging sensor is replaced by a tiny CMOS camera, and the light source is replaced by a tiny LED. And we have some control electronics that in the first version are attached by a wire. And all that fits on top of uh, the mouse's head, and the mouse can walk around with it. And this is essentially what was invented uh, by, the, by the Schnitzer lab, uh, by Kunal Ghosh and Mark Schnitzer and colleagues, and published uh, uh, a few years ago. And so as a first step, we decided to see if we could, uh, in, a, in essence, uh, replicate a lot of what their microscope delivered and try to make some advances. So we designed this head-mounted microscope. And uh, we, we refined the connectivity to the DAC hardware by replacing the, the wires that, that they would use by, with a very fine gauge wire that both delivered power and also uh, took all the data that was generated by the camera and brought it to the DAC hardware. Later, I will show how this is replaced in our, our wireless microscope. And then the DAC hardware connects to a computer and all this interfaces with a behavioral camera that allows you to watch the watch the uh, the animal and correlate the activity you see in these circuits with the behavior of the of the animal itself. Uh, we've also, as I will go into later, uh, put tried to to make this as open source as possible. And uh, we've generated a website called miniscope.org, and uh, this website users and developers can interact, uh, all the, the parts lists and designs and, and, and uh, circuit board uh, layouts, all the software is all provided there and, and people can go there and develop their own microscopes and even make improvements to the current microscopes 
there's a lot of interactions. And so I'll go into this a little bit later, but I think this is uh, a, a critical thing for the development of this open source resource. And so what do these microscopes in essence look like? This is the animal uh, on the left. You can see the mouse is carrying this microscope and uh, the, a lens, uh, which is, you can see is this, uh, let me see if I can point to it. Um, this, uh, this grin lens here, uh, which is, uh, a cylindrical piece of glass that acts as the focusing mechanism uh, gets implanted over whatever structure you'd like to image. The, the cells will already be expressing the genetically encoded calcium indicator that you're interested in. And uh, uh, later on, uh, the animal is brought back and a base plate is implanted over the head of the animal, which, which holds the microscope in place. And this is adjusted with while the microscope is on the head of the animal to image the maximal number of cells. And eventually, when the animal needs to be imaged, the, the microscope clamps onto this base plate, uh, the cells are imaged, and when you're done, the, the animal doesn't have to go around with the microscope on his head. And so what, what will happen is the animal will, uh, the microscope will come off and the animal will go back. The, the great thing is uh, the, the, the microscope can go back the next day or the next week and the same exact uh, group of animals are imaged, uh, the group of cells are imaged. Uh, and, and this is all interactive with the behavioral camera. Here you can see uh, the raw images that, that we record uh, and the delta F over F images uh, that we've been, we've been also recording. Uh, and you can see that the signal to noise ratios are quite high. And it's almost as good as two photon microscopy in this this example, and so this is a, a large group of CA1 neurons, several hundred CA1 neurons that we imaged while this animal was walking around. And so a little bit more about the microscope. Uh, so, uh, so you can see uh, a layout of the, micro the initial microscope that we designed. Uh, this is uh, this is the microscope body that is machined um, uh, and the designs are all there in the Miniscope website. Uh, this is the grin lens uh, that we use. Um, and again, I'll point to things. Uh, this is the, the grin lens here. And uh, I, the excitation light and the emitted light go through it, and this focuses the light. And uh, the light will go through, uh, the excitation light is generated by this uh, LED light, uh, uh, this LED which will uh, shine light uh, that, is, that is focused uh, on the sample, and the emitted light goes back up through uh, the emission filter and through the achromatic lens and eventually focused onto the CMOS imaging sensor. It's a very simple design. Um, uh, everything is held in place uh, by a set screw, and, and uh, this, is, uh, surpri this surprisingly simple design leads, uh, leads to very stable imaging over many days to weeks. And here you can see um, both the emitted and excitation light, uh, the excitation light provided by the LED, uh, which is uh, reflected by the dichroic mirror through the grin lens, and the emitted light comes back up uh, through the dichroic now and past the achromatic lens onto the CMOS sensor. You can see that the, the resolution of the camera is quite good, and uh, we can get 30 to 60 hertz imaging, which is which is clearly fast enough for, uh, for the existing GCAM sensors. In the future, uh, it's possible that faster sensors, even voltage sensors, may come out, and this will require us to update our, our cameras to, to allow us to image at higher rates. Um, and so you can see here that the path the light takes through the, the several grin lenses. Uh, this is a two grin lens setup. Uh, with a relay lens and, a, and another grin lens on top. So you can see all, this is how we, we designed the microscope. 
This is an example. Hopefully this will play. Uh, we're having some difficulties here. But what, what you would see uh, here is this animal running back and forth on this track uh, and the cells flashing. And, and below you can see the delta F over F uh, calcium traces. Uh, uh, each, each time the cell bursts, uh, of ac the cell fires a burst of action potentials. You can see these deflections up and the slow decay of the calcium transient. And you can see that this is a few of the cells that are that are uh, displayed, but you can typically record these from several hundred cells and over several days, more than a thousand cells in one uh, hippocampal recording. And the, the critical thing is you'll be able to go back to the same cells day after day, week after week, and record from the cells as long as the, the, the calcium indicator expression is stable. Uh, so uh, we have tested in our lab, uh, we have tested these microscopes in a model of epilepsy. Um, uh, we were, in, in, in this particular experiment, we were interested in epilepsy, uh, in a model of temporal lobe epilepsy, because epilepsy is associated with cognitive dysfunction. Uh, there are these, these people that have epilepsy have a great deal of memory difficulties. It's important to understand the mechanisms that are underlying this. And so in temporal lobe epilepsy, there's a lot of reorganization of circuits. Uh, a certain vulnerable cell populations die. Other, other cell populations try to adjust by sprouting connections into places they normally wouldn't. And this re results in a rewired uh, hippocampus and ultimately um, altered uh, uh, encoding of memories uh, and uh, poor memory retrieval. It's, this is a progressive condition. This will get worse and worse as uh, the epilepsy progresses. So we decided to try to understand how place cell dynamics are altered in this model and how, more importantly, how place cell uh, stability is altered. So we uh, created a, a model of epilepsy. This is the pilocarpine model where animals have a prolonged seizure. Uh, this two-hour seizure uh, is ended by an injection of diazepam. However, uh, after this prolonged seizure, there's a great deal of uh, plasticity and change in the hippocampus. There's cell death and sprouting, like I said. And eventually, this process leads to uh, spontaneous seizures. So just like the humans who have spontaneous recurrent seizures, these mice will have spontaneous recurrent seizures which will get worse and worse as they grow older. And they also have a great deal of memory difficulties on a lot of cognitive hippocampal dependent tasks. We, will implant, we implanted grin lenses on these animals and then water restricted them and trained them to run on a linear track. And so doing this, we will be able to see place-related activity on the same track over several days. And what we were aiming for is to see how well do these specific cells encode place uh, location and how well uh, is this is this encoding stable over time? Is it stable, or do, is there is there a lot of remapping uh, in these animals, and therefore instability of their place cell representations? And so, essentially, what we found was uh, that uh, there's there's a great deal of place related firing in both control and pilo animals. The pilo animals, the epileptic animals, show a little bit of a mild. Uh, decrease in the amount of spatial information that their firing provides. You can sort of see that here uh, with uh, a little bit of fuzzing out. Um, I'll try to again point to it. Uh, the, the place fields are a little broader and uh, less precise compared to the controls. However, the, the, the big finding that we had is that these place fields are considerably less stable. In the control animal, you can see if the place fields are plotted uh, uh, day after, uh, in, on day three, in the same order that they fired on day one, you can see that you can, even though there is some remapping, you can clearly see the same representation uh, shown here by this diagonal, which looks fairly similar to what it looked like in day one. However, in the epileptic animal, the same uh, place fields, if you plot them on day three as the animal runs through the track, all the place fields have now moved, and uh, the place field, there's a great deal of instability in this representation. Uh, 
uh, that's not to say that the animal doesn't have place fields three days later. If you take the same cells and reorder them now uh, three days later, you can see a fairly good representation of space. It's just not the same representation. The same cells are now dif representing di different uh, locations in space. And uh, we have some quantification which shows that this is essentially um, that about 40% of cells retain their place fields in the control, whereas very few cells are retained in the epileptic animals shown in red. So we were excited by this, and this is a, a way, uh, this is a great uh, functional biomarker for us to test various uh, treatments that we hope to, to test in the future to see whether we can improve, improve these place cell representations to, uh, and make them more stable. Um, and we're in the midst of doing that. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our wireless microscope. So we wanted to improve the, the microscopes that we, we currently have so that uh, one thing is to get rid of the wire. Uh, because when animals are tethered by a wire, you're always limited by how far they can travel. Also, um, another key thing is that uh, the, uh, the wire may tug on the animal a little bit and, 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 uh, and alter it, the way it behaves on common tasks. For example, we've discovered that in social behaviors, the behaviors are not quite the same when the animal is tethered by a wire. So we wanted to get rid of this wire so that we could test the animals in very large environments, very complex environments, including tunnels where uh, these wires would not work. Uh, also, we have a lot of collaborators that are interested in testing these microscopes on animals that travel very large distances or even flying animals. And so uh, there was a great deal of motivation to develop these tools. And so we went through several, just to show you the development of these microscopes, we first designed everything out on a big big circuit board and then we miniaturized uh, what we found, uh, what we designed uh, to a 5.5 gram version uh, with the battery. Uh, the, the imaging is uh, right now at 15 frames per second, but we're trying to speed it back up. Um, and uh, we can get about 10 to 20 minutes of recording. And uh, what we'd like to do is to, to basically miniaturize this further to below four grams with the battery. Uh, the key thing with this microscope is that there's no wire. So what happens to the data? Uh, the data is stored on a micro SD card, uh, which you may be familiar with. There's a great deal of capacity on these cards. And so um, the, all the data is saved on this card. And at the end of the experiment, the, the card is removed and then uploaded onto a PC. Uh, the, the power, which is, so the wire delivers power, whereas in the wireless version, the power is delivered by a lithium uh, a LiPo battery. And so the, one of the key things is to get these batteries as light as possible, but to give enough capacity so that we can do a 15, 20 minute uh, recording. So the, the, the key thing, another key thing is that the, the uh, micro SD card is not the limiting reagent here as far as how long the recordings can be. You can record for well over an hour if the battery held up, but the, our batteries, uh, so run out after 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so uh, in an animal that's larger, that can carry much more weight, so you can imagine a, a rat or a monkey or, or any other animal, the battery can be quite large. And so the, this wireless microscope could run well over an hour without, um, without problems. You could also imagine ways where this uh, microscope gets triggered to turn on and turn off and therefore, um, greatly saving its battery life and be able to be used over several, uh, several hours. And so this is an example of what this uh, looks like. This is an animal wearing the wireless microscope. This is a bit pixelated here, but in my version, it, it looks much less. So it, it's essentially identical to what, um, to what we record with the, with the wired microscope. There's no difference and the behavior of the animals is quite excellent, even though this, this particular version is a little bit more than four grams, the animals can be trained to carry it and do the task. And so we're quite excited about this development and hope to release it soon in our open source version.
This is uh, our wiring schematic of the wireless microscope. And you can see uh, the top view where the micro SD card gets mounted and uh, um, the, the, the various components that which make it possible. The, the MCU uh, that runs the whole circuitry and the CMOS imaging sensor at the bottom. And so, like I was saying, we'd like to go below four grams with the battery. We'd like to get more than 20 minutes of continuous recordings and 20 frames per second at least. Uh, and we'd like to be able to uh, trigger the microscope to turn on and turn off through IR communication. Uh, and we'd like to also be able to make it so that we can have a wireless microscope become wired if we have other needs for that. So we'd like to be able to design that. And we're very close to completing this this part of the project. Uh, as part of the Brain Initiative grant, we also uh, promised to build several other miniature microscopes. One was a, an optogenetics capable microscope. And so this is a microscope where uh, you can not only do calcium imaging, but to be able to deliver uh, light uh, to turn on op, uh, or turn off cells using optogenetics. What we had in mind was, um, essentially uh, a version where there's, instead of one LED, uh, there's two LEDs, one blue LED to excite uh, channel rhodopsin and uh, another LED to excite uh, this uh, other uh, calcium indicator, JR Camp 1A, where, the, uh, where the, the emissions, the excitations of the two don't overlap. And so we'd like to be able to image the JR Camp 1A at the same time as we excite uh, channel rhodopsin and be able to see how this excitation of whatever cells are expressing channel rhodopsin alters the activity of these cells. So this is something we're currently designing and building. We, we know that the JR Camp 1A works fine. Sorry. Um, whoops, that doesn't work. Anyways. Um, and we know that the JR Camp 1A works well, uh, almost as well as the G Camps. We'd also like to develop uh, two-channel imaging. We've had some trouble because of chromatic aberration through the Grin lenses. So the red and green cells that we image haven't exactly lined up in the z-axis, but we have many uh, different solutions that we're trying in order to develop these uh, uh, two-channel uh, microscopes so that you can uh, image both a red and a green channel together. So finally, uh, a little bit more about our, um, our miniscope.org website. Uh, this is, slide is a little bit old. We have over 1,500 user accounts. Uh, we have hundreds of visits to our wiki site every week. Uh, there's over 150 labs that are building the microscopes. We know because of, uh, we have access to who is, who is uh, ordering the various parts. And so that's our estimate that about 150 labs are building the microscopes. And we hear from them quite uh, frequently. Uh, I've heard from a lot of people who've been able to finally secure an NIH grant that they've been trying to get for a while by incorporating this new technology. And uh, it's critical that you know we, we don't make any money off these microscopes. They're quite inexpensive to build, uh, about less than $1,000 for our standard versions. Um, uh, there's active discussion boards where people that are building the microscopes discuss issues that they may have or suggestions for improvements. Uh, we've also had several workshops uh, where usually 20 to 30 people come to each workshop. One of the workshops is very large uh, right before the Society for Neuroscience meeting, so several hundred people attended that. But in these workshops, uh, people learn how to assemble the microscopes how to implant them, the tricks for the surgeries. Uh, all this stuff is actually also on, on the miniscope.org website. Uh, and uh, everything that you need to basically pick up these uh, microscopes and start using them is there. Um, and so we don't, a lot of people are using them and we never actually even hear about it. The, the slide shows all the logins to our website from all different parts of the world. And people actually have attended our workshops from Israel and Korea and Germany and Japan and a lot of other other countries. So we're we're very happy that sort of the obstacles to the use of these uh, technologies um, are 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 being um, uh, 
have been removed and uh, and that uh, I've even heard of people that are instituting these microscopes that in undergraduate classes or even in high schools they're building these microscopes and using them not maybe implanted on animals but uh, just as, as as sort of desktop fluorescent microscopes for as, a, as projects for their students uh, and and so I, I'm really a big believer in really removing all the barriers such that all it takes is someone who has a really good idea and they could build the microscopes with very little money and to be able to use it and gather data and then sort of build off their idea. Um, these are uh, pictures of several of our workshops and uh, you can see that uh, a lot of people are interested and, and we will have our final workshop in, in April uh, in, in mid-April. Um, and uh, before I end, I, would, I, I already thanked Alcino Silva and uh, Baljeet Kak and Dijan Markovic, uh, but I also wanted to thank other people that have helped. Uh, Daniel, again, who designed the microscopes, uh, Tristan Schumann and Denise Kai, who, um, who uh, tested and, and optimized the microscopes with revisions. Um, uh, Katie McGuire and Chris Lee from my lab, Sai Lu from uh, Valchi Cox lab, um, Michael Yartsev actually at UC Berkeley who has been uh, openly working with us to improve the microscopes for wireless capability, uh, Satiris Masmanidis and Tad Blair who have been designing uh, a, a combo scope uh, that, that includes both electrophysiology and imaging that I didn't talk about. I also wanted to acknowledge the UL1 Brain Initiative grant that funded all this work and uh, also support from our dean's office and our departments of neurology, neurobiology, um, and physiology. Thank you so much. Thank you for that informative presentation, Dr. Golshani. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question from our audience today is, do you think these microscopes could be used in animals other than mice? A lot of interest in people that are working uh, with other models. Uh, they, like I said, there's interest in people that, that are studying uh, communication and navigation in bats. Uh, also, uh, I know of uh, people studying marmosets that are trying to implant these microscopes and use them. Uh, uh, there's a big interest from the primate community to, to implant not just one but multiple microscopes to do calcium imaging. Um, so uh, there, is, there is a very uh, big interest. A lot of tools need to be optimized for these model systems. Uh, in, in rats, we've had some difficulty, for example, imaging hippocampus, whereas in mice, we've, uh, we've had no difficulties. But rats, because the, the orient is thicker, it's been harder to get the, the cell bodies in focus in CA1. So I give that as an example of the difficulties that you can have in imaging uh, different structures and different animals. But I think they're all surmountable. Uh, all these problems uh, can, can be surmounted and, and uh, it just takes some trial and error. Okay, we have time for one more question. What are the downsides of using these microscopes versus two-photon microscopy? About the, the upsides, the upsides uh, of the microscopes, uh, so there, there's a lot of advantages. Uh, one is that the animal is uh, freely behaving, uh, so it's not head restrained. There's a lot of behaviors that are very difficult to do in head restrained animals and uh, that's uh, something that uh, we've been 
trying to uh, to get over, but uh, having a uh, having a microscope that just fits on the animal's head and gets rid of the head restraints is is a really an amazing thing for all those behaviors where head restraint doesn't make sense. Um, so that's that's the positive. Then the negatives uh, compared to two photon microscopy are um, the you may not have the, the Z resolution to be able to perfectly distinguish several cells that may be on top of each other such that if they became active at the same time, you couldn't really distinguish them. And so there is, there is some, some worry that you may uh, end up with multi-unit recordings at, at rare time points when you in fact wanted to record only from a single unit. And so this problem is much less of a problem with two photon microscopy because, because, of, because the, 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 the ability to optically section through tissue is much, much, much better with two photon. That being said, there are labs that are trying to build two photon microscopes. Um, they are already some have been built which seem quite excellent. And so this seems to be a direction where you may want to go. Um, uh, there, there may be some downsides. For example, you'd be more sensitive to the Z motion using a two photon because the cell could come in and out of focus more rapidly than, than an epifluorescent microscope. So, um, so I, I think there are, there's certainly some advantages and disadvantages to two photon microscopy. With two photon, I think you can image smaller structures, dendritic spines, axonal boutons, which you may not be able to with the epifluorescent microscope. But all these may, may change as you, um, as we go on and develop this technology. Thanks. Thanks. Dr. Kolshani, thank you again for your presentation. Do you have any final comments? To say that I'm very excited to be to say that I'm very excited excited to be developing this technology with all our collaborators, and uh, I'm excited that uh, that people will have access to this technology and to be able to incorporate it into their into their labs at very low cost. And that's always been our goal: is to share as quickly as possible once the equipment is tested, uh, to share our technology so that it can it can be used by by anyone who who wants. So I'm quite excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.